right, welcome back to our programming at SPX 2020, our virtual convention. Uh, up next is Comics and Contracts. My name is Rob Clow, I'm the moderator. And with me is the interim director of the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund, Jeff Trexler. Uh, and uh, one overwhelming thing that we've had uh, from cartoonists in, in what kind of workshops we're doing at SPX since that's an important part of our programming is I need to know more about legal stuff. I need to know about contracts and it's a giant blind spot in the education of those cartoonists who are able to go to art school. Mm -hmm. um, but even more so for those who are entirely self-taught and haven't had the, the opportunity to go through an educational institution uh, to learn things related to the craft and the world in general, um, very few people actually teach them, this is what a contract is like. This is what you should think about. Um, so Jeff, welcome. Glad to be and, here. Um, and uh, glad to have you. Uh, Jeff is, to give you a little of his background, um, it'll be in the bio, but uh, I like to refer to him as the smartest person I know. <laughs> Uh, loves comics of all kinds, has been to SPX with me. I've shown him the room. Uh, he has an incredible depth of knowledge with regard to the law and incredible passion with regard to not just comics as an art form, but as, um, but for the creators who make it. And uh, in, he, he took this position, and he can talk a little bit more about this later, uh, in large part to uh, enhance and enlarge the advocacy portion of the CBLDF. Um, let me start you off uh, with something kind of basic. Uh, if an artist doesn't have the means to afford a lawyer to look at a book or book or comic series contract, what are some general common pitfalls that they can be aware of right, right away? So, uh, and that first question we'll be talking about for the next three hours. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> there, there's a lot that people could know. And, and one of the first things I wanna say is that part of the reason I do what I do is, uh, is a deeply held belief that law is not just for lawyers. Uh, this is all about breaking the cartel. And I've been, I've been Glad to do this for nonprofits. That's how I started my career teaching nonprofit organizations and nonprofit managers the basics of law. Um, I, I went on and been doing a lot in the fashion industry for the past 10 years, as well as uh, a CLEs for the comics community and the comic convention. And I am delighted to be here with SPX and to be able to uh, just to be able to, to help you find the legal tools that you need in order to turn comics from a passion into a livelihood. You know, comics are, have been an incredible economic driver from the beginning. Uh, they've been a way for people who are out, who feel like they're on the outside or on the margins of, of industry, who are on the margins of community, who are on the margins of America. It's been a way in. It's been a way to build something meaningful and personal for so many people. Uh, and, and anything I can do to help, I, I'm glad to do. Uh, with respect to your first question, there are a number of there, there are a number of things that one needs to think about when you are creating a contract. And the, the first thing I want to say is um, building on what I said before is you need to understand that contracts are not just for big companies, and contracts are not just for when you have the business role into a significant degree. You know, one of the big questions I get is when is it, when should I form a corporation? When should I enter into a contract? You know, when, when should I get this thing papered up? Uh, and I've seen a number of people who feel like what they should do is they and their team, they create the comic book, they uh, start putting it out for sale. Uh, and then they say, that's the time to form a corporation or an LLC. That's the time to get everything down on paper. But at that point, it's often too late. So um, understand that a contract is something that, a contract is your friend, a contract is something that can help you from the beginning. And the more rights you have spelled out from the outset, 
the lower the likelihood that you're going to get in some conflicts with the people who've been working with you on the book or the people with whom you're doing business. Um, and I would also want to say that uh, I know we're going to be going over a lot of uh, legal doctrine and practice tips uh, throughout this, this session. Uh, but one way you're fortunate if you don't have a lot of money, but you have a little money, is we're living at a wonderful time to get legal knowledge. So don't be afraid to get books from, say, No Low Press. They have a lot of good books on contracts and intellectual property. Uh, get comic-specific guides, like Thomas Crowell or Gamal Hennessy uh, have comics guides. There are people, lawyers who've worked in the comics industry who have step-by-step -step guidance in forming a comics business, uh, entering into a contract, hundreds of pages, but well worth having by your side. And that could only run you, you know, 20 or 30 bucks. Um, so you're living at a, at a great time. With respect to pitfalls, a few things you should keep in mind. One, don't assume that you can't do it. Don't assume that you can't understand it. I've had several people in comics that I've helped say to me, well, the contracts are just for the lawyers. I don't understand this. Uh, if you can help me do it, great. Um, and sometimes people who don't have lawyers who feel like they, they can't afford lawyers or, or, or legal advice, um, they'll just go ahead and sign the contract, assuming that it sound, if it sounds legalese, then that's okay. They don't have to understand it. Try to work your way through that contract because um, sometimes there are traps and sometimes even the people who have created the contract for you, if you would say working, uh, doing a contract with a major publisher, sometimes people haven't read the contracts and the contract may actually be an amalgam of several different deals over time with new provisions added uh, every few months or every new deal. Uh, and you may end up, the, the contract could have some things that are contradictory, problematic, or inapplicable. So read that contract. And then for common pitfalls in the contract itself, a few things you want to uh, pay attention to. One, make sure it's the right party. If you have an LLC or a corporation that you want to have manage the rights to the book, um, then you need to make sure that it's a party to it and that that is the, the, the person, the legal entity entering, entering into this agreement. Um, if you uh, are, if, if, you, if you are in a position where you have say several deals or you have a day job or you're feeling a little sick and you're not sure that you can make the timeline that's in the contract with respect to deliverables, don't assume that you can renegotiate that somewhere down the line. Um, if you feel like there's not enough time in the contract, but you actually need a little more, at the time of entering, entering into the contract is the time that you need to uh, approach the other side and get yourself a, a favorable window of time for your deliverables so that the other side doesn't have an excuse to either cancel the contract or uh, hit you up for damages for delay in the book getting to market. A few other things in comics in particular. Editing. Uh, you don't want to get yourself in a position where the other side has unlimited rights to do uh, to request edits. Essentially, sometimes so much that you're being asked to write or to illustrate a different book. Uh, you want to make sure that there is some sort of mutual understanding about edits. Um, there's a section in the contract that you're going to be tempted not to read because it sounds like boilerplate, and it's called representations and warranties. And this would be the point where I imagine if you're listening to this, um, even the name of it sounds boring. Even the name of it <laughs> sounds like something for lawyers and you should sort of set it aside and, and figure it as boilerplate. But I have had people come to me for help because of specific requirements in the representations and warranties that they did not realize could have some very specific applications to them. The biggest one is intellectual property. It's standard in comics contracts for you to say, I am not infringing on anybody else's copyright or trademark. Uh, I have all the content here is original, except maybe for material in the public domain. And by representations and warranties, you're saying, I represent this, I warrant this. Uh, if it's not the case, you could end up losing the contract. You could end up owing some damages. Uh, if the publisher gets sued, there's a clause that sounds really fancy and lawyer-like, but it means a lot, indemnification. It's often the case that if the publisher is sued, that you will have to pay for any fines they have to pay, and even more prob problematic, you might have to pay for their legal fees. What was the name of that section again? Indemnification. 
And the, and the whole section with regard to that, was it called indemnification? And the indemnification, sometimes it's broken out as a separate section. Sometimes it could be just a separate paragraph, um, but look for indemnification. I-N-D-E-M-N, -E indemnify. I like, double in, like double indemnity. Yes, like double indemnity, yes. Yes, yes, yes. It's essentially saying that you're, you're paying for somebody else's uh, stuff. And in comics, it's, it's really risky because sometimes you know, um, you could end up using a song lyric. You could end up uh, using an artist. This is a big thing. You could use somebody else's photograph as a reference. You could use a piece of artwork as a reference. It could be protected by copyright. Um, you know, you, you could, you, th there are a number of things that you might be using to help you illustrate the book. And now as awareness of these images is growing and growing, and the use of these images is growing and much more easily discoverable online, you might find yourself in a position where you get contacted by some rights holder, a photographer, a movie studio, um, you know, poet, you know, who knows what, um, and they could be looking for some money. And if the publisher's insurance doesn't cover it, you might end up having to pay. So indemnification clauses are incredibly important, um, particularly if you're using references or you're using swipes or some kind of, uh, you know, modified swipe. Um, Something Swipe, else. You mean homage? Yes, homage. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Exactly. I'll use the you know the, the fancy French uh, term for it. Uh, right. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Shepard Fairey. You know, he did the Obama Hope graphics. Yes. That was actually based on a photograph from an, a photographer that got disseminated over the, through the Associated Press, and he ended up having to pay damages over that. Um, that was that was a, a big case. Um, and, and, you know, a comic book can ha sometimes have 20 or 30 of the uh, images that are based on photographs uh, or celebrities. And, and so there's something that you really start, need to start paying attention to because creatives are becoming a lot more aggressive. Um, in, your, um, in your experience, <clears throat> how rigid are publishers in terms of um, insisting on indemnification versus... Pretty, rid pretty rigid. Uh, it's, it's come to be seen as a standard clause. Uh, and so, you know, at this point, I think it, it still is the point in comics where it's a buyer's market. There are a lot more people trying to break in than there are uh, publishers. And, and so the publisher has to ask itself, am I willing to take a risk on this or, or not? And the best way to allocate, the cheapest way to allocate that risk is to, well, is to have is to push it down, and so you're pushing it down on the creatives, who are the people in the best position to know whether what they're doing is original or not. And so that's indemnification is very standard, and unless you have a significant amount of market power in comics, you might you will probably find resistance to getting that clause removed. It's standard in publishing as well. I mean, you know, non-graphic publishing. So creators just need to, be, <clears throat> need to be very careful and aware uh, of their financial responsibility if they do that. Yes. And so now sometimes you could be fortunate in that the publisher could have their own insurance and then you end up covering what is, say, in the deductible. Um, or the publisher just may feel charitable. But particularly nowadays, like, yeah, you may think it's not just, a, it, you may think, well, it's just the large publishers and dealing with small publishers, but the small publishers are the ones that may need more money. You know, they, they may not be able to afford the insurance or they may not have the insurance. And so if there is a problem, they're more likely to look to an outside source and that outside source could typically be you. So take indemnification seriously because I have had to help people with indemnification issues. Um, and you do not want to have to face a five or six figure payout for legal fees and um, licensing fees. And you definitely don't want to be in a position where somebody can stop your book from going out or have your book pulled from the shelves. So pay very close attention to that. Uh, a couple other things to pay attention to. Uh, one is termination. Um, yeah, be aware of the fact that if you end up not being able to deliver, you may have to pay the uh, advance back. You know, so suppose you get five, ten thousand dollars for a particular uh, book, and you end up not being able to follow through on the book, but you spent all the money. 
you could owe that money to the publisher. And that, that would be very standard. That'd be quite standard. Um, you also want to be cognizant of the conditions for you to terminate your particular obligations. So for example, um, suppose you work for a publisher and you discover that the publisher has just agreed to do a graphic adaptation of Mein Kampf, you know, Adolf Hitler's autobiography. Uh, and you don't want to be in the same publisher as the, somebody doing the same, as doing the graphic novel version of Mein Kampf. So you, you want to look and see what the termination provisions are. Does it, is it a provision that you can terminate within a certain period of days? What are some of the conditions of termination? Uh, is there, and does it have to be for cause or can it be for any reason at all? Uh, and is there one thing we're finding more and more common now are some sort of, uh, you might want to call it a cancel clause, that is to say if there's any social media uproar, uh, and that could work not just uproar against the publisher, but if there's uproar against you, the publisher might be able to drop you based on, uh, immediately based on the contents of that particular clause. So you want to pay very careful attention as to what they say about your social media use, usage and your public reputation. Um, there might even be a clause in there limiting what you can say on social media. So, um, and we've seen plenty of examples of that recently in the regular publishing world, but also mm -hmm. in the comics world as well. Yeah, I, I understand that the comics world is all peace and love, and there's never any controversy. But <laughs> I just, you know, introduced this just as a background. Of course. Um, no, I'm I'm kidding. Obviously, there's a lot there, there's a lot of potential now for problems, particularly with social media and a literal cancellation based on something you say or a publisher says. So you want to pay attention to what's in the contracts. And one that has come up for some comics creators recently is the independent contractor classification. And this is really tricky. Uh, in California and several other states, they're introducing a new test. They've introduced a new test for determining whether you are an independent contractor or an employee, and it's a lot easier to be categorized an employee in California and several other states. Uh, there was recently a small bit of reform in California that should exempt most com comics freelance. It should exempt comics freelancers, including artists, arguably, although there's some ambiguous language with respect to artists. Um, but one of the consequences of this of, of categorization, it has it can affect uh, whether or not companies will hire you. If a company uh, sees you more as an employee than an independent contractor, they may not want to hire you or keep you uh, on board. Uh, and it could also affect intellectual property rights because the default rule for IP, for copyright, is that if you're an employee and you're producing this in the line of business, say creating a comic book for a comics publisher, uh, then the assumption would be that you're doing it as work for hire, which may be against what you're assuming uh, to be the case uh, for this particular work. Um, all right. Well, I think we've kind of gone through the everything in the first question about the common stuff. Let's dig in a little further. Mm -hmm. um, with regards to contract language, what are some th common things that artists should be aware of, starting with the following topics? First, licensing. Mm -hmm. This is another area where you want to be clear uh, in terms of, uh, and by licensing, uh, I, there are different Types. I mean, you could be licensing a character to use in a book, or is very common. Uh, you could have somebody licensing your characters to use in merchandise. I mean, that's a very, very common uh, thing. Uh, you could also be, you could be licensing somebody else's characters to use in merchandise. So, for example, uh, in the geek fashion realm, a lot of what they do there is they have licenses with Star Wars and, you know, with Disney for Star Wars and Marvel, Marvel characters and DC Comics characters. Uh, so it's a growing revenue stream, um, major revenue stream for creators uh, and people who are working with licensed properties and merchandise alike. So there's several terms that you want to be thinking about uh, with respect to this. One, a very basic one is, is your relationship exclusive or non-exclusive? So are you going to, be, say you're licensing something, are you licensing a character? Will you be the only one in the marketplace in that particular product line? Or will you be competing against everybody else that uh, is licensing the character in, say, fashion or soap bubbles or whatever, whatever's being, uh, whatever the product? Um, exclusivity, non-exclusivity uh, can be very important. 
Uh, territory is also important. Is it just for the United States? Is it for a region and within the United States? Uh, is it for specific countries overseas? Is it worldwide? Uh, that can affect the pricing. Uh, it can also affect your ability, what you can sell and, what, uh, and where. Uh, people are even getting, in terms of divvying up the rights, people are even getting specific about uh, whether, you can, whether you can sell it online, whether you can sell it, say, in an in-person retail in a store. Uh, and so you need to be very careful about sort of just the, the, the venues through which this product can be sold. Uh, or if you say are uh, uh, licensing it out for use in other media, what media can be exploited in? And exploited, by the way, in intellectual property terms, is not you know exploited as in taken advantage of. It just means that somebody's using that property in, in, a, in, in a particular medium. All right. So um, further along these lines, kind of two related things: mm -hmm. um, who owns the copyright on the work? and issues like reversion rights. Mm -hmm. um, uh, how are those written? What's, what's kind of standard? And, uh, and again, uh, what's the best way to negotiate in your own favor here uh, when working on the contract like this? Uh, this is, some of this comes down to market power. Uh, there, just, just frankly, there are some creators who have, um, if it's a known creator, somebody who's been in the, been in the market for a while, publishers know that they're like a, you know, like a Neil Gaiman, that they're, they're going to, you're going to have that person, his name on the book, and that book is going to sell because of that person. Uh, such that, that kind of an individual may have a lot more market power than somebody who's just breaking in. And so uh, terms can vary based on literally who is making the deal. Um, but you might be able to make some, you might be able to negotiate to your favor. You, you just need to be aware of the fact that uh, you have to know your own limits in terms of what's going to make or break a deal um, and, and, and understand that what you get might change the longer you're in the business and the more success you have along the way. So with respect to copyright, one thing I'm going to do, I want to make clear from the outset is the difference between copyright and trademark, uh, because this is something I see creators making, mis particularly new creators, making mistakes in quite a lot. And you, you see it even in comics where, where Spider-Man will say, oh yeah, uh, somebody's taking advantage of my copyright in Spider-Man. No, 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 no. The Spider-Man, if he's using it in merchandise, that's a trademark that is, or, or for particular services, like you know, being a hero for hire, so, um, that is, the trademark, that's a source identifier. Copyright is an original work of authorship. So the stories and illustrations, the, the, the sort of thing you associate, the, the comicness of a comic is typically covered by copyright. The title of the comic is typically trademarked. So that's what you, or, or certain characters whose name, names or likenesses are used for, to, to promote various products to be trademarked. So understand that key difference is going to be important because they all have certain rights to them and they all may be certain things you can license. Now with respect to copyright, um, it's important to know who owns what. So suppose you are an indie creator and suppose you're a writer and you're working with an artist and you're working with an inker and you know, you're know you working um, with a letterer and you know, somebody does flattening, all the stuff that goes into making a comic. Um, if you don't have spelled out the rights in a contract early on, you could end up in a right to dispute among your own team um, that could end up becoming very costly to you. you know, case in point on this one is Robert Kirkman in Walking Dead. Do you remember there was some dispute over, I think it's, I don't remember that dispute's going on, uh, but among the original creators of, of The Walking Dead, it's who owns what, or you can think about who should be credited as a creator of Black Lightning. That was another uh, thing with Tony Isabella. Uh, so having this thing spelled out from the beginning is going to be absolutely key. Um, another thing to keep in mind is the difference between work for hire and um, sort of creator owned. Uh, a work for hire is, uh, I, and there is no legal concept in copyright for creator owned, or a creator isn't even really a, a concept in copyright. It's about author and you're thinking about, you know, who owns, who 
has the original rights to this original work. And so in a work for hire, um, you could have a situation where suppose a, a corporation employs an artist, that'd be a very typical thing, employs an, a, an everyday, say, employee. Um, the corporation would be the author of that comic for comic book purposes. Now, that person may consider themselves the creator, but that, from a legal standpoint, would have little to no legal, legal significance. We're, we're talking about the, the corporation is the author of that work, if it's a work for hire. Um, and the corporation may enter into a contract with you and uh, as a writer or artist, and you may agree in the contract that it's work for hire, in which case, from a legal perspective, you are not the author of that work. The publisher or whoever is the other party, they are the author of that work. So you need to be very careful uh, if there's a written agreement um, as to who owns what. So the default is a work is not work for hire unless there's a sign, um, unless there is this written agreement. Uh, but if there is a written agreement, then you, you, you need to be clear as to who owns what. A very common setup right now in contracts is for it to be, there'll be language saying this work is work for hire. Uh, and if a court should find that it's not work for hire, then all rights are assigned to you know, the, the other contracting party. That is very, very typical, and it's basically a fail-safe, a way to protect the publisher or anybody else in that instance. And I say publisher, but it's not always the publishers. Suppose you are a writer or an artist who's come up with an idea. You may want everybody else on the book to be doing it as work for hire, so you own everything 100%. Or you may want to stake out from the beginning that everybody else who's worked on the book uh, transfers all their rights to you. Just to avoid the possibility to say what you had with the Neil Gaiman and, and Todd McFarlane and Angela situation where they didn't have this stuff spelled out and then Neil Gaiman sues and, and the court says, well, you can still use this Angela character and you have, you, you are a co-owner of Medieval Spawn and so uh, if that had been spelled out with more detail to begin with, Neil Gaiman wouldn't have had grounds to, st to state the claim. Um, so that, I hope this helps, Rob. Does that give, explain a little bit of the difference of a work for hire versus just a transfer? And there's something else I want to say about it, but I, I wanted to make sure we're on some even footing here with respect to what these concepts are. Yes, absolutely. Um, this particular audience will probably be more interested in um, and less as part of like work for hire, working for the machine mm -hmm. sort of thing. Although there are plenty of indie cartoonists who do their own independent work and work for another publisher to be right. sure. Um, but a lot of people are doing it are often entering into contracts with small press publishers. Um, and uh, actually, and this is going to segue into the final part. Um, and, and I will get to a version, by the way. I just want to, I, I didn't forget that. Yeah, actually, well, let's come back to that because I want to get to, I want to talk about something else mm -hmm. uh, that's part of this is that, um, you know, as you say, a contract isn't just something that a big company pushes on you. Okay. Contracts are things that can exist between two individuals, between a small company individual, between two small companies. There's, there's variation in the language in there uh, determines everything with regard to the nature of that <clears throat> relationship. And so oftentimes and uh, historically in comics, um, those publishers of whatever size, uh, if they can take advantage of an individual who doesn't have knowledge of the law or access to the law, 99 times out of 100, they will. Uh, similarly, there have been situations in small press, uh, uh, publishers that regularly uh, exhibit at SPX, for example, when doing their contracts, uh, a big thing that people are discussing is um, media, multimedia mm -hmm. rights. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and because small press publishing theoretically seems to be at a much smaller scale. Um, and the people who go into small press publishing aren't people who are necessarily, their first thought isn't, am I gonna get a TV show out of this? 
they're doing this because it's art. They're doing this because it's a labor of love. <clears throat> but they're also entering into it with a publisher. And publishers always think about these things. Mm -hmm. So um, there have been instances where part of the publishing contract put into place as boilerplate was we publish this, you retain certain rights with regard to the characters and comics form, and we retain all media rights in perpetuity. Yep. This is not uncommon. Right. Um, how, as a creator, if I'm a young creator, I'm entering to my first contract and I see that, how do I deal with that? How do I negotiate with it when necessarily I don't have a ton of um, necessarily marketing power initially? Mm -hmm. Well, part of it's going to come down to choices, but I want to step back for a second and give you an example because you may have heard, and I don't know how many younger creators are familiar with this. I know this is a big thing when I, it's part of what got me interested in intellectual property law was say reading about the Siegel and Schuster lawsuits about the, the creation of Superman. And it's actually a good uh, teaching tool for this because at first they were paid a page rate and that page rate in, in, in getting that ten dollars a page, if I remember correctly, one hundred thirty bucks, thirteen pages, uh, all of the rights to everything in the story, the characters, everything went to the publisher. And remember, when Siegel and Schuster were starting with Action Comics, Detective Comics, that was a small press. You know, that was a company that just emerged from bankruptcy. It, it it wasn't you know a major multinational corporation at that point. So it was the fringe of the fringe. And so they're getting a page rate and um, this thing hits and it goes huge. Uh, and um, all of a sudden they think they don't have any, you know, they're not getting money from this, as much money as they deserve. So they actually enter into the, the publisher gave them, and this is a sign of a small press. The publisher said, hey, you know what? We want to do right by you. We're going to give you another contract. We want to keep you on board to do this. And they gave them a contract with merchandising. They had provisions for exploitation in other media, something for newspapers, something for other media. Um, it talked about options for characters based on, you know, other material that these people create. Uh, it was, it talked about audit rights, you know, uh, you know, or actually the, that they ended up being an issue was audit rights in terms of, in terms of being able to, to audit the contract. I don't remember if it was an, an exact provision um, or whether it was just something they didn't trust. Uh, and there was a term, a five-year renewable. And all of these basic, that's what really ended up being the dispute about, uh, it was about in terms of DC comics exploitation of other material, that, other material that was similar to Superman. It came down to auditing and what auditing rights that Siegel and Schuster had, whether the rights were, whether the books were going to be trusted, uh, and licensing and the, and the amount of money they were getting from being exploited in other media. So this is something that goes back to the beginning of comics, and it's important to pay attention to as many details as possible, and it is never too early to do so. So for example, the clause that you gave, and I actually have, I made some notes about this because I wanted to have some specific language. Uh, a very common clause would be throughout the universe in perpetuity in any and all media now known or here and after devised, you know? And, and what companies are trying to do is they're trying to make sure that, you know, they've been through the CDs, they've been through the evolution from radio and newspapers to television to, record albums to CDs to you know, movies and DVDs and all that stuff and streaming and Blu-ray. They want, they want to be covered for everything. And if you're working with a small press, you know, a small press may want to get as much money from this as possible. And they may uh, arguably overreach and try to take everything from you. In which case you might want to say, you know what, I'm not sure I want to work with you. If all you're getting is a page rate for your creation, then you're just doing Siegel and Schuster 2.0 and you may end up with nothing very quickly while somebody else gets rich. Um, you might be able to negotiate some kind of royalty system for yourself. Um, and again, a key thing there, to, percentages aren't the most important thing in royalties. Uh, you could end up having a 50% deal that is a lot less worse than a 15% deal or an 8% deal because the 50% could be based on a very narrowly defined net amount so where the publisher is deducting all these costs or, or the 15% may be based on say a gross amount, say the amount of a book or amount of a movie deal, you know, amount of songs based on your comic or a Broadway play, which you now need to realize is, is something that could happen even for indie creators. I mean, if there was a, I think there was a play about uh, the Toxic Avenger. You know, if there's a 
if there's a play about the Toxic Avenger, there's going to be, there, there could be a play. Well, there's a fun play home. about Fun Home. I was about to say there's a play about Fun Home. You know, th there could be a play about anything and you want to make sure that, that you have some kind of rights reserved for yourself if you, um, if that might be a possibility. If you're not working on, say, another company's property, but you're working on your own. So if you feel like, if you feel that this property has some potential or it's just what you're pouring your life into and you're dealing with a small publisher who wants everything but doesn't give you anything or just gives you say a page rate or a very very small royalty or they calculate the royalty in a way you don't trust then you might just need to turn away and sometimes in turning away that actually is the leverage to give you the other to give you the deal because the publisher doesn't want to see you go or they may just let you go in which case you might be able to find a different publisher or do it yourself a bit of this is going to come down to risk management i can't there is no silver bullet. I can't tell you that, you know, when these three easy steps, you will prevail in every negotiation with every publisher ever. You know, the, there's some negotiating psychology you can do, but um, have a sense of your property and don't, if you do, you know, ask yourself, if this thing takes off, am I going to be happy with this deal? If you're not going to be happy with this deal, then you might want to hesitate and negotiate before before signing it because you could end up regretting it for the rest of your life and there are plenty of people who have regretted things for the rest of your the rest of your life absolutely um, all right let's loop back around to reversion rights because you mm -hmm. had a few things to say about that yeah um oh and one other thing i want to say just just to, to throw this in because this has become an issue if you are entering into a contract with a publisher or with your artists or you know inkers and everybody else who's working with you on a deal um you may come across something called a term sheet where the basic terms of the deal are spelled out with the boilerplate and more things to be added in the future. And everybody's happy and they have a little champagne because they have a term sheet and agreement in principle uh, and then with the full contract to come later once the lawyers pay attention to it in more detail. The only problem is in a number of states, um, a term sheet is considered as binding as a contract. So you want to make sure that you're happy with the term sheet because you end it end up maybe it end it could end up being as as binding on you as a full contract would be, uh, even if you don't enter into a full contract. Now reversion, what's that? I, I can't hear I you. No, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. The whole Siegel case, in fact, turned on that because they entered into a term sheet in the settlement. Then Mark Toborov came in and persuaded them to that they could get a better deal. But since they had the term sheet, the court said, "Sorry, you entered into this agreement. Done." Um, it was the same principle applied with the Winklevi twins and, and um, in Facebook, which was directly cited in the Siegel and Schuster lawsuit. Um, okay, with respect to reversion rights, this one is tricky. And I'm going to talk about one clean situation that everybody's going to encounter and another one that you have to be careful about, particularly if you are an indie creator, because there's something about this that you may not realize if you're an indie creator with other partners. All right, so reversion rights, one of the things you're thinking about is you want to avoid the Alan Moore Watchman situation, right? Um, you want to avoid a situation where you enter into a deal with a publisher, uh, the publisher has the copyright or, or has the right to, or the publisher could own the copyright uh, as long as the book is in print and then the book stays in print forever and ever and ever amen and there's no chance in hell that it's going to uh, go below the threshold at which it reverts back to you and you could end up being very angry and upset and bittered about that for the rest of your days although you may not have to and I'll get into that in a second so you want to pay very careful attention to so for example does what does in print mean this is actually a, typically a defined term in the contract and you may say this is just for the lawyers, but make sure you understand it and make sure you can live with it because your ability to get the book back can turn on it. Does in print mean that there's a certain, say, like a thousand copies in print? Or does it mean that it's just being offered for sale anywhere? You know, what's the threshold for something to be in print? An issue in which this is turning now is does digital count as in print? Do print on demand copies count as in print? Because if they do, then you're never getting that book back. If print on demand is, is in print, then forget it, you're done. So um, unless there, of course, is a threshold, say print on demand and say no more than 
and fewer than say 100 print on demand copies were made that particular year to people who aren't connected to the publishing. So you, you need to pay attention to the specifics because that, that can determine your fate. Now, there is an out clause. And this is where it can be tricky for you as an indie creator. Um, suppose you have entered into a deal with your rights and, and there's one particular contract. I'm not going to spoil it because I can't spoil it legally because of legal ethics. But there is a contract floating out there where somebody is very creators rights oriented and everybody who works on the book uh, has retains the rights to their material which is great and very generous um, but the problem is the potential problem is something called termination rights that that's how the heirs of siegel and schuster were trying to get superman back the termination rights is a way that if you entered into a deal and the book ended up being or whatever it is ended up being worth a lot more than say the original contract contemplated and you wish that you were getting more money from it, after a 35 year period, you can get that back. You can file for what's called a, a termination of transfer and there's a particular period of time before the 35 years you can file and you know, it's, it's very, very technical. But, um, but the big principle is for 30, at, at 35 years, you can get that property back. It's not the full length of the copyright. Uh, so, for example, I know that Alan Moore has talked a lot about Watchmen. Well, that was, what, 30, I don't know when they signed the contract. Was that 35 years ago? Yeah. Uh, uh, that would be the point at which somebody who was a creator who owned this, assuming it wasn't work for hire, could file to get that copyright back. And typically that's used as a negotiated provision to, to get a better contract going forward. Often, these things are often settled out. It rarely works out. But, somebody actually takes the property back. It's more like saying, I'm going to take the property back unless, you know, negotiations, you give me so much more money and you come up with a deal so that the, the publisher has the rights going forward. But the, the last issue was published in 1986. And I think that's when the, the mm -hmm. collection came out. So that means that next year mm -hmm. is, is uh, potentially this thing could come back. So, um, with respect to you, you may think, well, you know, I'm not negotiating with DC. I'm not negotiating with Disney. Yeah, but think about everybody who's part of the book. And if the inker has a piece of the copyright and the um, artist has a bit of the copyright, and even the letterer has a bit of the copyright, suppose you were very generous with your copyrights. After 35 years, they could file to terminate their transfers to you. So if you're the writer of the book, uh, who has a bunch of people on the team and, and take that copyright back for themselves. So there's a limited lifespan here that you need to be dealing with. And it's one reason why many people who are pro creators rights will end up entering into contracts with everybody else on the team that's worked for hire because they don't want to lose their property after a period of time. Work for hire, there is no termination or transfer because the whoever was the author for purposes of work for hire owned that from the beginning and there's no transfer to terminate. So you need to be very careful. And this is particularly the case, say, if you have characters that have become popular and who are being merchandised out for a, a number of different purposes, uh, it could end up putting real crimp in your ability to merchandise unless you enter into a much better deal. So termination of transfer can work very well for creators, but it can also hurt uh, creators of all stripes, but it can end up hurting someone down the line if they feel like the property should be all theirs and that everybody else is just doing their bidding in terms of, uh, of bringing their vision to life. Um, that's very useful information. And how long is a copyright generally? 70 years? Well, it's, you're talking about the life of the creator plus 70. So life of the author plus 70 if it's a non-corporate. So uh, different if it's a corporation and they own it for a longer stretch then it's a fixed number. Uh, but the life of the author is a baseline plus the 70 afterwards. So not all copyright not all copyright lasts the same length, although for works, there's a cutoff around 1963 uh, where works before are, um, are have a different copyright length because there was a different copyright law. Uh, and that work is actually coming into the public domain on a year by year basis. Last year it was 1923 that came into the public domain. Next year, 1924 comes into the public domain. 
so it's less author specific for that. That's more something that's that's based on a, on a general term for, for everything. So uh, you, if you're if you're doing copyright clearance, you really have to be careful uh, in terms of you have to look to when was the thing created, uh, sort of which copyright rubrics is going to apply, uh, and um, and then you're looking at some of the basics of the biography and whether it was a work for hire or not. It's a very complicated, it's a very complicated process, which is sometimes people hire lawyers or copyright clearance companies, which may not necessarily be attorneys, but just people who are trained in copyright clearance to help to help them out in terms of figuring out whether a work is available to use. All right, so we're nearing the end of our time and I have a, oh, no. I have a few quick questions. Yep. We kind of touched on it earlier, but just to be clear, so it's a copyright violation in your work to depict quote song lyrics and depict TV shows or any other images without permission, correct? And this is where it's tough. And I want you to pay very careful attention to this because you've heard a lot, a lot of it is from legal academics or certain public interest groups talking about fair use. And there are some principles of fair use, you know, length of the work, the nature of the work being quoted, that sort of thing. Um, the, the use to which it's being put, uh, or the amount that you're using in, the, in, the, in, in your work. But remember, fair use is a defense. It's not this, this thing where you say it's fair use and therefore um, you can't just wave it or, or pronounce it like a spell and have people go away. They could end up suing you and asking the court to determine whether or not uh, it's fair use. And you're raising the fair use defense and then you have to show that it, to the court's satisfaction, that it, it qualifies for fair use. So, which is why sometimes, even though you may feel like you have a clearance, it's a fair, fair use, like say two or three words from a song, for example. It's clearly recognizable as from that song, but it's only a small part of the song. You may say, well, that's, that should be fair use. Um, well, maybe it should be, but that's not necessarily gonna stop the publisher, or the, you know, whoever owns the copyright from coming after you for some money. It all depends so, on how litigious they feel like being. Exactly. And you can actually go online and see this. There's an active trade in uh, rights to songs, rights to films, uh, rights to residuals. The, the Star Trek, I know this, this is being filmed on a, a Star Trek day. And uh, coincidentally, or not coincidentally, the rights, the, the um, residual, director residual rights for the Star Trek movies are at auction. The auction's closing today. Um, so you can get songs, you can get you know, movies, you can get a lot of things, all the different rights parceled out and they go on auction and people trade it. So, and whoever owns those rights is investing in those rights and they may come after you for the smallest amount. And you also need to be very cognizant of what are called publicity rights. And this is a big issue. Uh, suppose you model a character after a particular actor, they could come after you. Um, and there are instances where they have, and I know, I know, I know that Save the Boys, which is very popular now, uh, Huey was based on Simon Pegg and Simon Pegg was very gracious and wrote a foreword and was very nice and you know now is starring in the thing. But many people aren't like that. They do sue or they do issue demand letters asking for money or telling you to take the book off the market uh, if they find that their image has been used in it. So do be very careful. One rule of thumb is just because you've seen somebody do it on the internet or do it in a book doesn't mean it's legal. It just means they haven't necessarily been caught yet. <laughs> this um, means they got away with it. Yep. <laughs> so, so you're publishing, so you're doing something with the publisher mm -hmm. and you want to uh, do something along these lines and you tell your publisher, hey, I'm doing this. Whose responsibility is it to get um, permissions? Is it their responsibility or your responsibility? It can go, often this is determined by contract. If there's, a rep if there's you know, represent representations and warranties and if you said that it's all original, and you know, and that you're not infringing on anything, and there's an identification clause, you may tell the publisher, but that's what you agreed to in the contract. Um, and again, it's not just the publisher. It's like if you're an artist working with a writer on an indie book, you know, that's also can come into play because representations and warranties can be found everywhere in terms of contracts where rights are at stake. So, and services are at stake. So. Uh, you, you need to, th to think about this and look for this because this could end up could end up hitting you. Uh, could you repeat the question again because there's something I wanted to say but I got focused on that and, and I didn't and I don't want to miss Well sure this. I talked about if um, 
Oh, if the publisher. Oh, I, got, I got it. I got it. I remember the question now. Right. Um, another thing that comes down to is enforcement. I've, I've been asked about this. Suppose you enter into uh, an agreement, say, with the publisher, and you see that other people are exploiting the work. They've adapted it in a movie um, without a license, or they're creating products based on it. And it may even be spelled out in the contract who has the responsibility to enforce it. The, often a publisher will have more resources to do that. So it can be to the creator's advantage to have that in the contract that the publisher will take X, Y, Z steps to enforce, to enforce infringement if it's brought to their attention by the creator. That's, that's, a, that's another provision you need to keep in mind. So you mentioned representation. Mm -hmm. Very quickly, um, as a lawyer, if an artist is trying to find an agent, what are some, um, what are some pieces of advice you might give them with regard to signing a contract with an agent? The percentages in the industry are often, they're very standard, like 15, 20 for US, you know, domestic versus international, that sort of thing. Um, and uh, the, 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 there might be a provision in there about suppose it gets, suppose you bring in a co-agent to do movie rights or exploit another media, the original agent, the literary agent gets a certain percent and it's done in a certain procedure. A lot of that has, particularly the more experienced agents, it'll be very, they'll have some standard rubrics that they use in every contract. But you also want to be on the lookout for people who will take advantage of you. Um, understand when the agent collects money and for what. So I saw a contract recently and somebody said, oh, I got this tremendous opportunity. This person's going to go out and find deals for me. And it's great. And it's percentage looks good. And I noticed that the contract said, even if the agent does nothing and the talent you know, creator uh, finds everything on their own, they still owe the agent that percentage. And that holds true even if they fire this particular person, every deal in perpetuity for the rest of this person's life uh, and estate and everything like that, uh, percentage goes to that original agent. And so you want to make sure that you just basically haven't given some person who's not going to do anything a lifetime annuity in your creativity. Um, uh, you need to look at, well, you know, what are the provisions for termination? When do they get, for what do they get paid? How much do they get paid based on the territory or the product? Um, those are some very, very basic things. So it sounds like if I'm, if I'm an artist, I want to have the opportunity to have access to a lawyer, not just for publishing contracts, but for agent contracts. Yes. Yes. Any kind of contract. Period. Any kind of contract. And this is one where, again, if you can't afford a lawyer, uh, you, th there's, there are written resources out there that are affordable that you can look at. Uh, and you might also want to start seeking some pro bono advice, if at all possible. Along those lines, and this is the last question. Excellent segue, sir. Um, I am aware that the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund uh, under you is you are planning to expand the services um, of what the CBLDF does because previously in the last 25, 30 years, it's been almost exclusively focused on First Amendment issues, which are important, but important in the sense that if your house is burning down, it's important to have the fire department. But on a day-to-day -day basis, it's been less useful to the lives of many working cartoonists. Mm -hmm. And I know that you're looking to expand and change that. Um, what a, I know that you're, you're, there's plans for more resources now, um, but in general, what's your philosophy on uh, what the CBL, CBLDF will be able to provide? And in particular, if, uh, if you'll be able to avail yourself to any questions. Yeah, uh, and I wanna, you, some of you may have heard that the, the, the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund mission only allows us to do the First Amendment. Um, I actually wrote on this on the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund website, cbldf.org. Uh, it actually refers to constitutional rights, and the Constitution is a lot broader than many people realize. For example, it protects contracts and it protects copyright. Uh, and there are also laws that have been uh, that are enacted under the Constitution, say, for example, through the Congress's right to regulate international it, it, interstate commerce. So my perspective on this is a lot broader, uh, and, and I believe it's 100% consistent with the mission uh, as written in its, in its legal documents, as well as the spirit in which it was founded. 
I'm very, to me, it's, it's not about expanding the mission, but it's going back to the original scope uh, and, and using the CBLDF to the fullest. Now, in terms of, of, of connecting to legal support, one of the things I want to say is watch this space. Uh, maybe not this particular video in particular, but watch in, what I'm going to be announcing uh, in the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund, because I'm working on some things that I think that you will like in that regard. Uh, more generally, if you have legal issues that you are wondering uh, what, um, what some of the answers are, uh, although, you know, it's technically, and this is the way legal ethics are set up, you know, none of this is legal advice. Go to a lawyer if you, you know, want for somebody to look at your particular contract. Um, if you have questions, email me and I will try to write about them on the website or answer personally in a general sense with that, with that caveat. Uh, and if you need a referral, I'll do what I can now, but again, more generally, just wait till you see, I just started at the Combat Book Legal Defense Fund. And um, if you had some concerns about this in the past, please rest assured that I'm working on alleviating those concerns so that you will not have them going forward. One of the things I, I, I underscore here, and it's part of the reason I took the position, I know that there are charities, wonderful charities, that are doing a lot to give financial aid to creators who have entered into poverty. And that's an incredibly valuable service. And I'm not, and definitely support those charities. They, they really deserve to be part of our nonprofit ecosystem. But I believe that the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund is uniquely positioned to give creators the tools so they never meet that fate. So that they can turn their passion, they can turn their dreams uh, into a profession, uh, and they can do it with the financial rewards that they deserve. So that's the vision, and we're going to be doing more on that in the future. But in the meantime, if you have questions, email me. You can reach me at either info at cbldf.org or jeff.trexler, T-R-E-X-L-E-R, at cbldf.org. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Jeff, for your time. Uh, I assume Thank that you. I assume and, and, you won't be billing me for this hour. No, I will not be billing you for this hour. <laughs> this is my pleasure. I love doing this. And I know, and I know there was, a, I know this is a bit of an info dump. Usually I'm, I'm, doing this sort of thing with a panel and doing a couple minutes or, or we're doing it over three hours. We, I, I, I crunch like three hours of CLE into um, one 50 minute period. So this, this is an informational resource <laughs> yeah. that I want people to be able to go back to and uh, really plumb because uh, you've just given a ton of very interesting basic stuff with which they can think about how to approach contracts and the very fact that, you know, you're making yourself available to the community as well as saying, you know, if there's something emergent, you know, contact me. Uh, but if you're looking for something a little bit down the line, hang on, we, we're going to do something a little more systematic. Mm -hmm. Yep, exactly. And again, and any general questions you have, um, email me and I will do my best to get back to you personally or, or, answer the question more generally through the website because there's no question too small. If, if you're raising this question, I guarantee you there are hundreds of other people who are raising the same question as well. So Absolutely. Well, thanks again, Jeff. All right. No, thank you. And thanks, thanks for giving this opportunity for everybody. And I look forward to connecting you all, with you all again. And I in person, I hope, in the future. Absolutely. As, as do I. And I, I look forward to seeing what you're going to be doing with the CB, CBLDF over the next few months. Sounds good. I look forward to it too. All right. Well, thank you everyone for uh, listening and uh, stay tuned for more programming. Thanks very much. Right.